Hi everyone, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. I'm wondering if this video is gonna get like blocked because of the title and the content within it, but I'm not like really talking about all of those things. I've just been reading about all of those things. Guns, money, tyranny, and they're important things to be informed about. So we're gonna talk about some books along those subjects today. This is my June reading wrap up. There's only one other book that I read and I got it from the library. I just had to return it. It was due back today so I can't like hold it up for you. But side note, I finally got a library card in our new city. I mean we've lived here for a while but it was like COVID and everything you know and now it's summertime and Mariah's old enough to take her out a little bit and Jensen's interested in going to the library so we've been going there like pretty often in the afternoons and Jensen likes to look at the books and play little educational games on the computer and for me it's so nice because I can try out so many more books and not have to buy them <laughs> so I feel like this is a game changer for me like I can just go to the library you know try out a new release or something and if I don't like it I can just return it and try something else but yeah I don't read like tons of fiction because so much of the time I'm like buying my books so I want them to be like for research or for my classroom or something like that so anyway finally having my library card for this library it's just like opening up a whole new world so the book that I checked out from the library this month was The Latinist by Mark Prins and I heard about this on NPR <laughs> like probably like the fresh air little book review section or something a couple a couple weeks ago maybe a couple months ago it sounded kind of interesting um, it wasn't one that I was gonna like order from Amazon, but I saw it at the library and I was like, yeah, let me check this out. So it's very pretentious <laughs> and that's kind of why I like it. I got to live in this world with the main character who is a PhD student at Oxford in classics. So she studies Roman poetry and there's like an obscure Roman poet that she, um, you know, is really like, she kind of has like an edge on that research so she teaches latin and she like there's there's all these like latin translations from her students that she's grading and so there are a lot of references that i didn't really get i never learned latin i don't think i even learned like the classics that well and by the classics you know we mean like greek and roman uh literature and poetry and stuff like that there's a lot of debate about how useful it is at the moment so um it was just kind of interesting to like be in that world and it basically ends up being like a horror novel because it's your worst nightmare she's done all this work it's kind of funny because she's from florida so i feel like that was like the antithesis of oxford <laughs> like if you're from florida and you can work your way out and like work your way up to the Oxford classics department um, but her professor that like oversees her research and her dissertation and stuff kind of like screws her over when it comes time to apply for jobs for the upcoming year and so that's like where a lot of the tension is like she just she's in this terrible situation where she has like no money because she's a PhD student she's in a different country so she's like reliant upon other people for her visa and everything and her future prospects you know are being tampered with and if you are a fellow nerd like me you'll love that the climax of the story kind of occurs at a an academic conference where she's giving a talk and you know presenting her research and that's a place in the book that's really like a turning point so yeah it's not gonna be for everyone that some of it is set in Italy and I have a couple of other books that I'm reading right now I always read like a few at a time that are also set in Italy so I love that one book always kind of like sends me on a few other paths you know and I can kind of see what else comes of it so anyway that was one of the books um, let's also talk about the other literary fiction book that I read this month and this one was with Amory's book club she always has the greatest recommendations I always love them and they're always something I hadn't heard of or like authors I hadn't heard of like I wouldn't have 
stumbled across this book on my own probably but it was really really good it's called trust by hernan diaz and on her instagram she um interviews the authors like at the end of the month after we've all read the book and then she saves those and listening to her conversation with him was so good like he's so interesting and it was really cool to hear about some of the research that he did for this book and like the ideas behind it and everything so this is the one about money and the structure of this book is so unique and so creative so if you just like start reading it you know and you don't know too much about it and you're just like huh you're probably gonna be a little bit bored at the beginning so let me just give you enough information without spoiling it to persuade you to continue so there are four different books within this book and they're kind of like a russian doll of books so the first one is a novel about this man who becomes very very rich kind of like right before the great depression and then even richer during the great depression so it's kind of this like gilded age wealth story you know but it's a little bit more focused on like how he gained that wealth so that part is pretty interesting like in and of itself but it kind of has a tone that's you know like a little bit more old school and you'll figure out why later um and then the next book within the book is an autobiography by another you know billionaire multimillionaire, and it has a little bit of a different tone and it's actually like a draft of an autobiography because you'll see that like some chapters and sections aren't finished they'll be kind of like etc etc little lists of like what to think about later so that's kind of interesting you're like okay so what is going on and then the next book is a memoir by a writer who lives like today basically and maybe it's a little bit earlier than now i forget maybe it's like the 80s or something but she's writing a memoir of when she was a secretary for a really rich guy in new york city when she was younger and she's italian american her father's from italy he's an anarchist and that juxtaposition between these like extreme capitalists and then anarchy is really interesting and this girl is i mean she's she's a woman she's a young woman um kind of like pushes back against both of those two kind of extreme realities and it's really interesting and then the final book within the book is like a, a collection of journal entries by the wife of a very rich man and this is the section that kind of ties everything together and as soon as you finish it you want to like go back to the beginning with what you now know and like read everything again and like pay a little more close attention to all the details and stuff it's just such an interestingly written book it's so cool it's so different it's about money and wealth and who gets to tell stories and legacy and like whether or not it's possible at all to be a good person and have so much money it's just really really good so i highly recommend this one weird different good i like it okay those were the fun ones now let's get into the serious ones this is the one about guns it's called gunfight by ryan busey busey something like that uh, my battle against the industry the radicalized america so this is a memoir basically that kind of like lets you inside the gun manufacturing and marketing world so this guy ryan he started off with kind of like a smaller gun company when he was younger it's called kimber i was not very familiar with different gun companies when i first started reading it so i don't know if that name means anything to you but he started off with that gun company uh you know like distributing their guns to different uh stores gun shows stuff like that and some of the stories in here are just wild like the people involved in the gun manufacturing and gun marketing industry are weird <laughs> it's a bunch of people who just like love guns love you know hunting and back when he started it was more like shotguns and 
Um, even like handguns weren't as popular to sell. And in a world with like very little ethics, like you'll be introduced to his boss at Kimber, who was nuts. Um, there's very few ethics, but like they do not want their guns to be like found at a crime scene. Like that's bad for business. So at least initially there are some, there's some semblance of like, you know, we don't want like guns to have a bad rap. So it's not like very well written and most of the chapters weren't very interesting. However, chapter six is called Killers, Cleaners, and Clintons. That one was really interesting. Uh, number 16, chapter 16, Couch Commandos, The Trump Slump. Cause he kind of goes in and out of like, this is his story of like how things were going for him. And then he'll give you like some information about like the political climate and the laws that have been passed, the legislation, you know, just like different things that have that impacted the gun manufacturers and marketers. And those sections are way more interesting. So the main thing that like sticks with me from this book is that the combination of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and all of the like visual imagery from that war that so many people were seeing mixed with video games, like first person shooter games like Call of Duty, mixed with soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and becoming like spokespeople, like influencers for gun companies, that created this demand for these couch commandos. So these couch commandos are just guys who want these plastic guns or black guns that most gun manufacturers didn't, they didn't really want to make these. Like they're into making these shotguns that are like, you know, beautiful in their own way, I guess. And like, you know, like finely crafted tools and stuff like that. And they didn't want to make all of these black guns that are used in literal war. Like that wasn't really where they were headed, but that demand became so great that they all just started pumping them out. They're like cheap to make. And for a lot of these guys, they're like accessories. So they just want these guns just to like feel powerful. It's a tool of intimidation. It's not a tool for hunting or for protection. This is a tool of intimidation and just to like feel like you're a soldier. And most of them had never been soldiers, you know. So just millions upon millions upon millions of these guns are sold and the entire gun manufacturing and marketing industry completely changes. And there were people who like stood up against this and they're like, no, 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 this is not like what we're about. But like talk about people being canceled. Like they were canceled by the NRA and the other gun manufacturers. They lost their jobs. They lost their positions like writing for like gun magazines and stuff like that. Anybody who tried to warn against this like new culture of extremism it was just completely run out. Um, and this guy, you know, like attends the NRA conventions and stuff. And just like, I mean, you already know this, but just like the peek inside those conventions is just disgusting. They're like dripping with racism, like the most disgusting, dark, evil racism that you can imagine. And that's all mixed in with this weird need for like power and to feel intimidating. And then of course the NRA constantly tries to convince people that the government is gonna take away their guns and they're gonna do all these things too. You're gonna lose your freedom. So you have to have all these guns. Um, and the book also talks about like the, the, the peaks in when gun sales go up. So after a mass shooting, people go out and like buy all the guns they can because they're afraid or they're told by the NRA that, oh, gun safety measures might pass. So get all these guns while you can. So it's, ugh, it's all disgusting. So there's probably like more that I want to read about this topic. There's just, I don't know. What else, what else do I need to know? Besides the fact that these little boys, these young men want to feel like they are powerful and then they go out and shoot up a bunch of innocent people and it's easy for them to get the guns. They're constantly being marketed. There are just like hubs of the absolute most disgusting ideas on the face of the planet on the internet where these people go and they're violent and they're racist and we just 
put guns in their hands and they go and shoot up little kids and 4th of July parades and it's absolutely disgusting and I hate it. I hate gun culture. I hate it. And if you are a responsible gun owner, it's up to you to speak up loudly and do what you can to try to turn around the radical extremism that is the NRA and it has completely infiltrated the Republican Party. And um, we all know this stuff, but it's, it's, ugh. it's so disgusting. And there's like very little room for anyone to just be like, hey, I like to hunt and I have like this nice shotgun that was handed down to me and I wanna like buy one for my son and so we can go hunting. Like I understand that. I'm from a super rural area where that's where, what everybody does. It's not like I'm a city slicker who doesn't get this, I, I get it. But that's not what gun culture is. That's not what gun manufacturers make anymore. That's not how they market things. And the NRA is like the most evil cabal of psychos who don't care whether you live or die. So yeah, so there's, so that's this one. <laughs> like with that one, you're just, there's no hyperbole that's too much. Like it, the NRA is a fascist organization. That's how the author describes it. And that's, those are all of the tools that they use and strategies that they use. So after that, I read this one, which is maybe the best book that I've read all year. This is On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder, and then it's illustrated by Nora Krug. And there's another version of this one. It's like the little pamphlet version, but I, I think this one is really powerful with like photos and drawings and images. And this one is um, 20 lessons from the 20th century. And it's like bite-sized history. It's not like written at like a, you know, super accessible level where it's like anyone can read it. Like this is written by a professor of history at Yale and it sounds like that and I love it. And when we look around at a lot of the things that are happening here in the United States and we just, we see the strategies of tyranny being used, the language of tyranny, the language of fascism, and one party just really embracing these undemocratic ideas and, you know, worshiping one man as their dictator, it's really scary. And democracy is not like fail proof, like democracies have fallen all over the world and fascist dictatorships have risen all over the world. About a hundred years ago, in Europe especially, there were quite a few fascist dictators who were able to take power. And so this book just kind of highlights like different ways that they did that, different strategies and different ways to resist. And they're like not always successful. I mean, there's some hope in like kind of having an idea of what's coming or like what could come and knowing what to do to prepare yourself. It's still really scary, but this one's just so good. I mean, I would use this with like seniors, you know, if you were doing like a comparative government class or maybe like a civics class or something like that. You, you could use this in teaching. I think it would be really powerful, but this isn't for like younger students. But as an adult, as a citizen of a nation that you would like to see like, remain a democracy, this is something really, really important to read. Like every couple months, pull this out and just get a little refresher. Like even things like just speaking to people in person, looking them in the eye, making small talk. That's something we've done less and less of because of like the pandemic and then because it's so easy on social media. It's it's a really nice way to, you know, keep up with people. We don't always get to see them in person, but just like as you're out and about, speaking to people, looking them in the eye, reading books, reading long form journalism, not sharing misinformation, just a lot of these very basic things, uh, you know, like donating to causes that you do believe in, becoming politically involved at whatever level you can or even you know just becoming involved in like a, a charity organization or a service organization like keeping our democracy healthy is really important and i think that just the nature of the pandemic and having to be inside not to mention all of the divisiveness that came out of it but like that has has weakened democracy just in the sense that people aren't out there physically with their bodies just like being involved in the community and in other people's lives and protest is great like that 
tends to be sometimes the only way that we go out and like, you know, physically interact with like, like-minded people, but also do that on a less intense level, you know? So this one's great. Probably, yeah, one of my favorites of the year, probably one of my favorites of forever, but it's just, it's so sad that we need to read it, but that's also like the point of the book. Like there's like the politics of inevitability and what was the other one? Politics of eternity, yeah. Both of these positions, inevitability and eternity, are anti-historical. The only thing that stands between them is history itself. History allows us to see patterns and make judgments. It sketches for us the structures within which we can seek freedom. So we can't think that it's like never gonna happen to us, and we also can't think that like all is lost, there's nothing we can do. We have to look at history, we have to understand that we are a part of history, and this book just gives you like a really good framework for that. So anyway, really really fun stack here for this month of june for july i'm purposely trying to read a little bit more upbeat a little bit more fun stuff although i am currently reading a historical fiction novel about the rise of fascism in italy because i feel like that's something I'd, i don't know all that much about <laughs> this book was kind of like mm, i need to know about it in like spain germany russia italy like all the all the places even like um Peaky Blinders right now, like the last season and I'm just getting into this new season is like that's the threat at the moment, right? Like even these like terrible people who murder people all the time and like sell drugs, like that's their line, like they're gonna try to stop the rise of fascism. So yeah, that's where we are right now, June 2022. <laughs> hmm. So yeah, what are you reading? Anything, anything more upbeat? Let me know, let me know. I'm foreseeing trolls because I said that the NRA is a fascist entity, but it is. So I will just block them. Good times. I look forward to, to managing the aftermath of this video. All right. Uh, I will see you guys later. <laughs> Bye.